Thanks for everyone for being here. Uh, my name is Kate Percival. I'm the Digital Accessibility Analyst for SUNY Oswego. And um, we're just going to walk through a little bit of PowerPoint Accessibility 101. Um, hopefully I will teach you of a few more things that you may not have known about within PowerPoint. I hope to provide some basic steps that will um, hopefully become habits for you that you can use to increase the accessibility of your PowerPoints. And at the very end, I'll give you a couple of resources where you can um, kind of follow up and maybe learn a little bit more or continue to read up. Um, one disclaimer that I do want to offer, different computers, meaning Macs versus PCs, and different versions of PowerPoint may alter some of the placement of some of the elements that I'm about to point out throughout this presentation. So if you do go back um, and look at the recording later, some things may not be in exactly the same place. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of throw that out there. Um, this is, this presentation, this PowerPoint is created on a PC and the version that I have is Microsoft Pro 365, um, the, the desktop version. So just kind of put that in there for everyone to be aware of. So we'll jump right in. Um, and Michaela, again, if there are any questions pertinent to what I'm speaking of, please feel free to interrupt me and I will do my best to answer them. Um, we're gonna jump right in with themes. Themes help determine the overall look of the entire presentation. Um, you can set the fonts, you can set the colors, you can set effects and so on. Um, this helps keep the look of the presentation consistent and it also helps multiple presentations be consistent with each other. So in order to find the themes, come up to the top, go to the design tab. And right here at the very beginning of the list is the themes menu. If you find the drop down arrow, this opens up all of the themes that are available within your version of PowerPoint. And you can see um, behind as I'm scrolling over that kind of changes things. While there are many themes to choose from, keep in mind that simple and clean is best, both for readability and for accessibility. Um, you can customize your own. So again, as we go through this presentation, I'll show you some things that you can do to, to modify things and to change things. If you get a template that you like and you want to reuse, you can come to the themes option, go to save current theme down at the very bottom, type in an appropriate name and the location um, is where it needs to be in PowerPoint. So you don't have to worry about changing the destination. And then when you click save, all of these themes under the custom section here, these are all things that I have tweaked and I've made my own versions of. So when you save something, it will show up in that custom section under the design tab. So again, that's kind of a quick, easy way to um, stay consistent and to reuse things that you like to use over and over and over again. Along with the themes, we have layouts. Layouts um, determine the look of the actual individual slides. And they are under the home tab. And you can come to new slide, which will add a slide in your document or in your presentation. Open that and this will show you all of the various layouts that are available within that theme. And the layouts will change based on the theme that you use. Uh, layouts, we try to avoid adding unnecessary elements to the built-in layouts and I'll kind of explain why in just a little bit. We also encourage using layouts with slide titles. Um, in many of the themes that you use that are built into PowerPoint, you will see a, a slide that says blank or blank slide. Um, don't use that. <laughs> Assistive technology doesn't like the blank slides and I'll explain why again in another few moments. Um, using the layouts helps keep the content structure consistent and it helps maintain reading order, which I will also explain coming up in just a few moments. Master slides are a basic template um, and not that many people seem to know about them, although master slides will make creating presentations infinitely easier in many ways. Modifications that are made on the master slides will affect the entire document. 
So it's easier to change things in master slides than to change individual elements on individual slides. Master slides help maintain consistency throughout your document. Again, anything that's changed within the master slide will be affected throughout the entire document. Um, just some quick formatting notes in regards to creating presentations. Paragraph text should be about 24 points and headings are anything larger. Sans serif fonts tend to be a little bit easier to read, especially for the smaller font sizes. And you want to try to limit information to one, maybe two key points per slide. You want to leave some white space and again, staying consistent with the font size of 24-ish points. Um, you don't want to try to cram too much information on a slide. That will be, um, it, it just becomes too burden, burdensome um, for people to understand. So with that being said, we're going to go to master slides now, come up to the very top menu and go to the view tab. And then over towards the left, you'll see slide master. If you open that up, this will bring up all of the templates that we just looked at. So this is all of the, the layout templates for this particular theme. And if you come up to the very top of the list for the top slide, most of the slides underneath, most of these subsequent slides are built or created based on this top slide. So if, for example, if we wanna change the font, come to the home tab, we're gonna to go to the font section. We're gonna choose something really obnoxious. Please don't use this font. Um, but anyway, you can see over in the slides on the left, with just that one click, all of the titles are now changed to that particular font style. So we're gonna undo that. Um, you can change the font size, you can change the color, you can change um, you know, the color of the footer. I have an Oswego logo here in the corner, that's on the master slide, so it shows up on, on any slide um, within the presentation that's used, that, that the slide is used, that logo will show up. Um, you can add like the footer, the date, and the slide number. Um, I've seen presentations, I do a lot of remediation work in my job, so I go through online course materials, and I've seen a lot of presentations where it's fairly obvious that the faculty has used a blank slide and just kind of thrown elements on. Again, that's not the best way to do it. Um, or if they add slide titles just by putting a number, I'm, I'm sorry, not slide titles, if they add slide numbers just by adding a number in the corner. Um, again, not the best way, makes a little more effort on your part. To add some of this footer information, we go to the insert tab and come over to the header and footer section. And then we can choose, I already have selected date and time and the slide number. And over here on the right, you can see these little boxes down at the bottom of the preview. When you check things, the box will darken so you can tell what it is that you're selecting. And then hit apply to all. And once we close out the master slides, that should be applied to all of the slides within our presentation. Um, quick side note, Microsoft PowerPoint and Microsoft Word work very similarly in many ways. So a lot of the features that I'm showing you here in PowerPoint can also be used in Microsoft Word. Um, obviously different applications, they're used in slightly different manners, but um, it's kind of interesting how the two applications sort of play off one another. So for example, when you create a theme and you save it, it will show up in both Word and PowerPoint. So just kind of a little FYI, I guess. Um, so we're gonna go back out. We're gonna close the Slide Master section here, come back to the Slide Master tab and choose Close Slide Master. And any change that you make will be saved. You don't have to save it an additional step or anything like that. You just close the slide master and it's saved. Um, and you can see the slide number is down here in the corner of the slide. So hopefully you can get an understanding that by using master slides, you can make simple changes and you can change them throughout the entire presentation, which will save you an infinite amount of time and energy depending on what it is that you're working on. Um, and again, like I said, not that many people seem to know about it. so. I find it um, very intriguing that you can do this within just a couple of clicks. Is there any questions so far about master slides or themes or layouts? Uh, just, I'd like to ask you a question about, um, I, I got you said about the 24 point size. Um, mm -hmm. 
the other things that we need to know about the size of the typography for various accessible uh, students? Um, anything else we need to know about size and spacing? Um, I would just kind of reiterate to um, make sure that spacing is wide enough to allow white space around the words. Um, like this particular slide, the master slide right here, I think this amount of information is full enough. If you wanted to add anything else, I might suggest splitting it and putting it on a second slide. Um, when you start cramming things in and the line spacing becomes too small, um, things become too close together, it makes it very hard for, for some people to read. If someone has um, cognitive uh, disability of some sort, it may become a little bit overwhelming for them to try to read all of that information. And as far as font size, um, again, I think 24 points in presentation mode. If you go down to, you know, nine or 10, obviously not really anybody's going to, the screen reader will be able to read it, but like sighted people won't be able to read it. Um, so again, just kind of, a lot of it is sort of common sense. And once you create a slide, sort of take a step back and look at it, you know, stand on the other side of the room from your laptop and see if you can read it or um, ask someone else to read it and see what they think about it, that type of thing. Um, just to kind of make sure that your words have, your words and letters have some breathing space around them. Does okay. that make sense? Yep, thank you, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. All right, we'll go on. We're gonna move on to reading order. And I mentioned this in the beginning. Assistive technology reads the elements on each slide as layers from the bottom of the list to the top. And I'll explain what list I mean. Um, if you come up to the top navigation, go to, I gotta close out some of my, some of my extra things here. Go to the home tab and come over to the arrange panel, arrange icon. And down at the bottom of the list, there's selection pane. If you open up that, now you see a little list, and this is all of the elements that are on this particular slide. Now for demonstration purposes, obviously I doctored this a little bit. I added in a couple of things. Um, and actually I inadvertently changed the order, so it's now correct. Um, assistive technology reads each of these elements from the bottom to the top. So this one will start out with reading order, then goes to the graphic, then goes to the home tab, paragraph, then goes to the bottom paragraph, and then it will read the slide number last. Um, unfortunately, I messed around with this a little bit, so it's correct. I do have a little demonstration. In order to change things, sorry, let me back up just a little bit. I'm confusing myself. When you use the built-in layouts that are available within PowerPoint, the reading order is already set. When you add elements to a slide, the software doesn't really know what to do with it, so it just kind of sticks it at the end. So it's easy for things, when you add elements to a slide, it's easy for things to get out of order. If you need to change the order of this list, all you have to do is highlight the element and then drag and drop it to where it needs to go. So it's that simple. Then you can rearrange things so it's the assistive technology is reading the list from the bottom to the top, and that's in the correct order. And just as a quick demo, I'm going to play um, what assistive technology would read when the elements are out of order. Slide six dash reading order, wheelchair access graphic, home tab M dash arrange M dash selection pane, bullet assistive technology reads elements as left quote layers right quote from the bottom of the list to the top, bullet built in layouts should have the correct reading order, heading level one reading order, bullet the software doesn't know what to do with added elements, drag and drop items into the appropriate order if needed. So if you could hear how it kind of stuck that heading level one reading order in the middle of the two text boxes. Um, and I'm sure you can imagine how confusing that would be to someone who's listening to things. So again, it's very important if you add elements to a slide, it's important to check the reading order to make sure that it is correct. Slide titles are also used by assistive technology. Assistive technology allows users to skim through a presentation 
using the slide titles. So rather than having to listen to the entire presentation, um, it creates a list of titles and they can jump from slide to slide. So it is important that each slide have its own individual unique title. Um, if you have multiple slides, the information um, spans over multiple slides, you need to differentiate the slide titles by saying like one of three, two of three, three of three, something like that, um, to kind of help the screen reader user understand where they are in the presentation. If there's an instance where you want to have the information or you have a chart or a graph or something like that on the slide and you don't feel that you need a slide title shown, if we come to the selection pane, again, go to the home tab um, and open up the arrange box, arrange icon, come to the selection pane. Over on the right hand side, you'll see this little eye icon. If you toggle that, it hides the elements on the page. So assistive technology will still read that title. So it's still useful for someone who's using a screen reader. However, a sighted user would not see that information. So with that being said, it's important that if you have extra elements on your slide to not simply hide them, but to remove them. Um, if you have extra text boxes or extra images or something like that that you have and you go through and you just toggle all of them off, anyone who's using assistive technology would still hear those elements being read by the assistive technology. So it's important to understand that they need to just be removed, not hidden. But this is useful. Um, I've seen it in many cases where you have continuation of information or whatnot and you don't necessarily want the title on it. You can just toggle it off. All right, we're gonna continue on to alt text, which stands for alternate text. Um, any non-text element within your presentation needs to have alt text associated with it. This allows someone who can't see the image to understand the meaning that is conveyed by that image. And I'm using the word image, but really it, it is associated with any non-text thing like multimedia, um, images, shapes, charts, graphs, all of those, they should have alt text associated with them. Alt text can change based on the context in which it's being used in. So for this particular photo, um, if I were just using it in a generic manner, it might, the alt text might be something to the effect of, you know, a woman standing on the top of a mountain or a woman standing on a mountain. Um, if I wanted to write a blog that described my experience hiking in the Adirondacks and I wanted to demonstrate a point using this image, the alt text might be something like selfie on top of Mount Joe with Algonquin Mountain in the background. It might be a little more specific. So there's a lot of gray area in alt text, but the bottom line is you want to be able to convey the meaning of that image or element to someone who can't necessarily see it. So in order to add alt text, highlight the image. You can try to right click and you might see this edit alt text option or you can just come up to the top menu, go to the format tab. When you highlight the picture, that format tab shows up. And then there's an alt text box right there. You can open up that. And then just add in, whoops, that's the wrong one. Add in the description. Now you might see this generate a description for me little box. We're actually going to take that out for a minute. Um, don't use this generate a description for me box. I'm going to click on it. It says a person posing for the camera. Well, that's like extremely generic and it doesn't really tell us anything about the photo itself. The software simply cannot add enough meaning to the image. Um, every element that's within your document or presentation should have some sort of purpose or some sort of meaning. And as the content creator, you are the best person to determine what that purpose or meaning is. Therefore, you are the best person to describe what it means to enter alt text. Um, again, the software just can't add enough meaning behind it. If the element is purely decorative, it, if it has no additional meaning, you can check this box, mark as decorative, 
or I would suggest consider removing it. Does it really need to be there? If it's just to take up space, if it's just fluff or filler, it doesn't really need to be there. Um, so you could remove it and not change or alter the meaning of the slide at all. Are there any questions about anything so far? Slide titles, alt text, reading order? Okay, we're gonna keep going then. Uh, moving on to links. It's important to know that assistive technology reads the URLs in full as they are written out. Uh, therefore, it's very important that you embed the links within your text. In order to do that, you highlight the text you want to have linked. Again, you can right click and choose the link option or come up to the top, go to the insert tab and find link in there. And then you can add the web address. And then click OK. And now we can see the styling is a little bit different. If we hover over it, you can see the little, um, uh, the web address pop up. So that tells us that it is now linked out. Um, assistive technology allows users to skim through their document using links as well as using titles. So it'll like make a list of all the links that are available within that document or presentation. So you want the link, you want the, the text that's linked to be short. You don't wanna highlight full sentences. You want the text to be concise and you want it to describe where the link goes. So someone who's listening to a list of links can understand where that text goes out of context. Um, you want to avoid vague phrases such as click here, learn more, visit us, that kind of thing that doesn't really tell the user where the link is going. Um, so you just wanna be very concise and very explicit as to where that link is taking the user. And again, have a couple of quick little demos. This first one um, is a screen reader, JAWS, reading this particular slide in its entirety. Slide nine dash using descriptive links. Example one, heading level one using descriptive links. Example one, for more information, visit our accessibility website at link https colon slash slash double. Oops. Sorry, everybody. Slide nine dash using descriptive links. Example one, heading level one using descriptive links. Example one, for more information, visit our accessibility website at link https colon slash slash www.oswego.edu slash accessibility slash. So you can imagine how having a, a document or a presentation that has multiple links in there that are multiple lines long, we've all seen those web page links that take up like three lines. Um, yeah, the screen reader is going to read that. So um, kind of keep that in mind as you're creating things. And this is the demonstration of JAWS reading the same information, except the link is now embedded within the text. Slide 10 dash using descriptive links. Example 2. Heading level 1 using descriptive links. Example 2. For more information, visit our link accessibility website. So if you caught it, it said link accessibility website. So that's the way that assistive technology differentiates um, the link text from everything else. And that lets a user know that they can select that and go to whatever destination it's bringing them um, to. Okay. Yes. Yes. We have a couple of things in the chat. Um, sure. So it says, if you alt tab out, we cannot see the window. You need to share the new window in Zoom. And then can you show one more time how to access the screen to remove items? Sure. Um, can you repeat the first one again, the alt tab? If you alt tab out. Right, okay. We cannot see the window. So you must have gone to a separate window. Oh, I didn't mean to, but okay, I'll try to keep that in mind. Because everybody see the using descriptive links example two? Is that what you're seeing right now? Oh, they're saying when you showed the alt text, we couldn't see it. Oh, I gotcha. Okay. 
All right, I apologize for that. Um, I'll see if I can describe that a little bit differently. And then you want to um, hide, hide things, right? The slide titles. Um, can you show one more time how to access the screen to remove items? The screens, okay, yes, I, I think I understand what you're requesting. So I went back to the slide titles slide, but it doesn't really matter. Um, if you go to the home tab and then the arrange icon and open the selection pane, can you see the selection pane when I have that open? No. No. Oh, yes, yes. Because it's okay. your side screen. Over here on the side, yep. yep. Um, there's little eye icons right next to each element name. And if you click on those icons, it toggles that element on or off. I, I hope that's what's being asked. So you can hide things without removing them. However, the assistive technology will still read them. Like the assistive technology still sees that element. So if there's just extra items hanging around on your slide, you want to just take those off altogether, delete them. Yes, that's what I was asking. Thank you. Okay, sure. You're welcome. I'm glad I understood it. <laughs> Additional question to that. Yes. If you delete it, but you want to put it back in later after uh, some time period, can you retrieve it or you have to reinstall? I think you have to like re -add, you know, re add it. You would have to know where the element is or just add a, a new text box or whatnot. Um, another alternative to that though, is you can duplicate slides. So if we come over to the slide menu on the left-hand side, if I right click, I can duplicate my slide. And then if you right click on that slide again, uh, you can hide it. Okay. So when you do presentation mode, it will skip from slide eight in my case to slide 10. But you can duplicate that and have other elements in there. Am I making sense? Yes, because I want to be able to some... save it for a yes. different purpose. Good. Yes. So you can have basically a duplicate slide and then um, the screen reader reads things differently in edit mode than it does in presentation mode. But I know that when you put it in presentation mode, it will completely skip over that hidden slide. So you can, you know, use it and save it and have the information there and handy for another time. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. And was there another question about alt text? That's what we couldn't see, right? Okay, well, if there is another question about alt text, um, I'll go back to it. All right, we're getting towards the end. We're gonna talk about tables really quick. Um, again, assistive technology can read tables cell by cell as long as they are marked up correctly. Tables should only be used for tabular data, not layout purposes. Um, so if you do include a table in your presentation or your document, I would say, ask yourself at the very beginning, does this need to be a table? Can I present this information in another manner um, that allows it to be shared equally? You want to keep your table structure simple. Um, avoid merged cells, avoid complicated multiple headers, that sort of thing. In order to add a table, go to the insert tab and right underneath you'll see this table icon. If you click on that, then you can add in, select how many ever rows and columns you want. We're gonna do three and three, and then just click on the grid and you have your table. Um, FYI, side note, this yellow is because of the theme that I have chosen. Yellow is kind of an awful color as far as accessibility is concerned. Please don't use yellow, <laughs> um, especially not for text. So this styles menu that's here in the middle, you can choose any one of these. And again, these are all based on the theme that you have. So you can choose another variation. Um, but again, we want to keep it clean and we want to keep it simple. You want to be aware of color contrast, light color on a dark background or dark color on a light background is best. Um, my suggestion to a lot of people is don't try to be fancy. Just present the information and make it look nice, but avoid using color in all sorts of fancy manners because it most often will backfire on you. Anyway, that was a side tangent. Um, 
In order to set the headings or the headers in the table, once you have your table highlighted, this table tools tab pops up and under the design option, way over here on the left, you wanna make sure that the header row is checked. And if your first column is also being used as headers, you wanna make sure that that is checked as well. And these two checkboxes are what determine to assistive technology where the headers are in the table. And that allows assistive, assistive technology to read the table um, a little more easily. So that's pretty much as complicated as tables can be. That's the basic bottom line. Make sure the header row and the first column, if necessary, boxes are checked. All right, so now we've done all these things to our presentation and we're going to use the built-in automated checker to help check it for accessibility. Well, most applications have an automated checker. PowerPoint has one, Microsoft Word has one. I know Google has add-ons that you can use to check the accessibility. These are great as a starting basis. There's always things that you have to be aware of and check manually, but using the automated checker is a really good way to kind of give you a guide and help you make sure that um, certain checkboxes are marked for accessibility purposes. There's two ways to get to the checker. Under the review tab, you may see this check accessibility option. Um, most definitely it would be under the file tab, come down to check for issues and then choose check accessibility. I'm gonna close the selection pane. We don't really need that right now. Um, so this list pops up over here on the right hand side of errors and warnings. Um, if you open up the heading and click on the actual individual element, it will bring you to that element in the presentation. Now, if you'll recall, I never did put in alt text for this picture. So it's bringing me there, telling me that my picture needs alt text. If you click on the drop down arrow just to the side, it will either help you fix the error or it will give you more information on how to fix the error. So we're going to choose add a description. And again, to open up the alt text box, Um, you can come to the format tab up at the top and choose the alt text option there. Is everyone seeing the alt text box or this is what we had issues with before, correct? I see it. You see it now, okay. So we're gonna enter in selfie of a woman on a mountain. And if you'll notice the error of alt text disappeared. So that means that we corrected it and we can just close that tab out. Now there's no way to clear warnings. This is just something to, that it's telling you you should be aware of. You should use captions for any audio or video. Um, there are closed captions available on my videos, so I'm not going to worry about those. And then check reading order. If you'll recall, I said earlier, when you add elements to a slide, the software doesn't know what to do with it. So this check reading order error will pop up. So if we go to slide six, this is the slide that I doctored up. I added the graphic, I added an extra text box. Um, and again, if we click on the side arrow, this will open up the selection pane. It says verify object order, and it will open up the selection pane. So we can go through and double check, make sure that the elements are in the correct order. Um, slide 10 was my added picture. Slide 12, 13, and 14, I believe are all my videos. Yeah. So. There's no real way to clear that out. You just have to like know that you went through and checked everything. And then we have a duplicate slide title. Again, as I said before, assistive technology wants each slide to have its own unique title to help the user understand where they are in the presentation. So if we click on that, oh, cause I duplicated the slides. So there we go. We have two slide titles slides. So in order to make that go away, um, we just need to add extra something extra. So we're going to put two of two on that one. And then in this other one, we would want to put one of two. Now to, um, I believe it was Jacqueline's question earlier about kind of hiding the slide and preserving information that you want to use later. If yeah. that is the case, you do not need to differentiate the slide titles. If you're only using one of those slides at a time, it's not going to matter. 
but if you do use both of the slides and they have the same title, the checker will yell at you. So that's, it's kind of that simple. Um, so we're gonna scroll back here. So again, just to kind of follow up on the accessibility checker, I'll close some of these out. Popular errors and, er and common errors and warnings um, there's missing alt text with images, graphs, shapes, um, charts, anything like that. Sometimes there's missing slide titles. You want to double check the reading order of things when elements are added to a slide. And there are often duplicate slide titles within a presentation. So those are things that you need to be aware of and check. Some things that will not be flagged by the accessibility checker. We've talked a little bit about small font size. You want to make sure that you're slide does not have too much information, that you're not using like nine point or 10 point font size because nobody will be able to read that. Um, it will not flag contextual links. So again, if you have a full URL written out, it's just gonna, the, the checker is just gonna let that go. Um, so you need to kind of be aware of that and go through and manually embed the links into your text. Low color contrast will not always be flagged and some of the newer versions of Microsoft, I think it might be. Um, but overall, that's something to be aware of. And again, just light text on dark background, dark text on light background is the best way to go. Um, try not to get real fancy with color because that can get kind of messy. And then the extraneous decorative images. Um, the automated checker is not going to yell at you for having 10 decorative images within your presentation. However, again, I would say, if you have that many extra decorative images, do you really need them all? Can you get rid of them and maintain um, the communication of the slide itself? So we've made all these changes. We've corrected our errors. We've gone through the accessibility checker. We've done all these things. Now we want to, for whatever reason, if you want to save it to a PDF, I know this is kind of a common practice. Um, I would say to you, the very first question to ask yourself is why does it need to be a PDF? Does it need to be a PDF? Um, I'm hosting a PDF remediation course this afternoon at two o'clock with um, Nasli uh, Kirkjian. Uh, so we'll go over some of the ins and outs and whatnots of PDFs. If you do decide that you need to save your PowerPoint as a PDF, do not use the save as option. You want to export it. And again, on some versions, I don't know about all, but on some versions, you may see this Acrobat tab. You can choose Create PDF using that, or you can come to the File tab and go down here to the bottom of the list to Export, and then Create Adobe PDF. Use that. That will help preserve some of the accessibility things that we just put in, and it will help reduce PDF remediation. Um, so just knowing that there's a difference between saving as and exporting um, is, is helpful when using PDFs. Some quick resources. Um, I didn't really want to spend 10 minutes reading websites to everybody. So um, the Oswego Accessibility website, which is www.oswego.edu slash accessibility. We have a lot of tutorials. I have step-by-step -step tutorials with, screen, with screenshots that kind of help go through um, different applications. I'm working on a series of videos, um, like five-minute videos that kind of highlight one aspect of accessibility for each of these different applications. So that's coming soon, hopefully very soon. Um, specifically, our tutorial for PowerPoint is at www.oswego.edu slash accessibility slash tutorials hyphen and hyphen tips slash PowerPoint. Um, again, just straight on the accessibility website, we have a whole list of different tutorials that you can browse through, look through. They give you step-by-step -step instructions. They give you screenshots to help you, to help guide you through doing some of these things. Um, and my email is kathleen.percival at oswego.edu. Um, if anyone gets stuck on anything, if anyone has any accessibility type questions um, regarding PowerPoint or Microsoft Word or PDFs, um, feel free to reach out. I can't guarantee that I'll know the answer, but I will do my best to um, help you out, whatever I can do. So that's- um, Kate, yes. 
we have several questions in yes. the chat and we have about five minutes left. Yep. Do you want to go into the chat and just kind of take those questions? Sure. Let me... And they also asked if you could, you know, on that last slide, you had several links. If you could put yeah. those into the chat also. Yes, absolutely. I will do that. Um, okay. Acrobat option is only there if you have Acrobat Pro. That could be the case. Yes. Export to PDF. If you don't have Acrobat, um, if you don't have Acrobat Pro, honestly, I'm not sure about that question regarding exporting using Acrobat Pro. Acrobat Pro DC is the only one that I've used. So I'm not really familiar with the other versions. Um, I would just say look for export, um, look for create, look for save as a PDF. Sometimes there's an option that just says save as PDF instead of just plain old save as, if that makes sense. Um, so I think the first question starts with Liz. Um, so in the selection screen, it shows the order in which the slides are read by the reader, bottom to top. Yes. Correct. Okay. Um, how do screen readers handle spot animation elements that appear on a slide? Ooh, spot animation. That is something that I am not familiar with. So I do not have an answer to that question and I apologize. Um, I can, I'm not sure to be very honest. Um, I've never used spot animation. I've never played with the screen reader using spot animation. So um, I'm not sure. Okay. Then does the export versus save as feature apply to Microsoft Word as well? Yes. I know a different, okay. Yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. That's okay. Um, I believe the Acrobat option is only there if you have Acrobat Pro installed. Would you use the export to PDF for Office options if you don't have Acrobat Pro? That is. Um, Yes, I believe that in Microsoft Word and PowerPoint, um, again, I'm, I'm not familiar with various versions of it per se, but I would look for an export option. Um, there also is an option that says save as Acrobat PDF. Um, I would tend to use that option as opposed to just the straight save as. Okay, that's it for questions. There's our two, there's our two links. And I didn't put the WWWs in there, but, um, and yeah, I'll put my email as well. Just to get there. All right. Um, whoops, sorry, I sent that privately to someone. I didn't mean for that <laughs> to everyone. There we go. Um, oh yes, there was one more. Uh, thank you, Mark Greenfield is here. Um, the main thing for Microsoft Op Office products is to use save as and not use print to PDF. That's a good point. Yes, do not use print and do not use interactive PDF. Um, I can't specifically explain the differences, but that's just something to know. You don't wanna print it to PDF. Um, you wanna try to save it as or export it. So I hope I offered some new information to people. Um, I saw a couple of kudos in the chat, so I, I thank you. I appreciate everyone being here. I uh, appreciate everyone's input and questions. Um, and again, please feel free to reach out if there's anything else that I might be able to help answer. Great, thank you. Thanks everybody. <laughs>